Thank you all for being here today. Hello and welcome. My name is Charmaine Nelson and I'm employed as a provost professor of art history in the history of art and architecture department, as well as the director of the Slavery North Initiative at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Slavery North is a new incarnation of the Institute for the Study of Canadian Slavery, which I founded in 2020 at NASCAD University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. I would like to thank my colleagues and students at NASCAD, as well as the community members and media outlets in Halifax, Toronto, and Montreal who supported me and the Institute. I would specifically like to thank the producer, Alex Mason, and the journalist, Jeff Douglas, who hosted me many, many times on CBC Radio Main Street, Halifax. With my relocation to UMass, the state's flagship campus, I have brought the Institute with me, expanding the mandate to include the support of research and research creation, that is artistic and cultural production on Canadian slavery and slavery in the American North. As before, we will continue to host fellows, one of whom you will meet today, to convene exhibitions, events, conferences, and talks, and to produce media work that engages both academic and lay audiences on these important and often erased histories. Please check the chat for a link to our new YouTube channel where you can view some of our important outcomes from the last two years and stay tuned please for the launch of our new website this fall. UMass Amherst sits on indigenous lands which have been stewarded by several indigenous nations for millennia. A critical engagement of transatlantic slavery of course necessitates the centering of black and indigenous histories and experiences and one of Slavery North's mandate areas is the study of Black and Indigenous relations. We gather for our first fellows talk as Slavery North. Thank you again all for being here. Uh, our fellow Emily Dracchio will be speaking for about 30 to 40 minutes. Of course, we're going to run over because we're starting late. So in total, we're probably going to go about an hour. And we're going to leave about 15 minutes at the end for your questions and comments and discussions, which I will moderate. So please note that this event is being recorded. And now to our wonderful speaker. Thank you for your patience, Emily Dracchio. Emily Dracchio, I'll introduce to you now, attended McGill University for her undergraduate degree, a joint honors in art history and anthropology. I am so pleased to be able to tell you that I've known Emily since she came out of what's called SAGEP or our college system in Quebec and first entered McGill University uh, for her undergrad. Her research focused on, uh, focuses on archaeology or focus on their undergrad on archaeology in India, as well as a history of Canadian dolls and their misrepresentation of Black people. She is currently a graduate student at the University of New Brunswick, pursuing a master's degree in history. Her master's research is focused on locating and analyzing slave quarters in New Brunswick through the examination of archival and archaeological material. Her research is supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Quebec Research Fund on Society and Culture, and of course she is also a fellow at the Institute for the Study of Canadian Slavery. She had her fellowship this summer. She currently works at the Provincial Archives of New Brunswick in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and she recently finished an archaeological dig in Maine in the summer of 2020. I hand it over to you now, Emily. Thank you so much, Charmaine, for your kind introduction for this opportunity. And thank you, everyone, for your patience. So I'm just going to share my screen now. And perfect. If maybe one person could just give um, a thumbs up that you can see it, that'd be great. Fantastic. All righty. So I'd like to begin my presentation by acknowledging that the land on which I give this presentation is the traditional unsurrendered and unceded territory of the Wolastawig. And I'm excited to be speaking uh, to you all today about my master's research, which is titled Ex Excavating Archives, Locating Slave Quarters and Mapping Enslaved People in New Brunswick's Loyalist Landscape. So my interest in the study of Canadian slavery really started during my undergrad at McGill when I took my first courses with Dr. Nelson on the visual culture of slavery. 
On the first day of classes, she asked me and my fellow classmates if by show of hands, we thought that Canada participated in the Atlantic slave trade and if we had learned about Canadian slavery in school. And I sat amongst over a hundred students who like myself didn't raise their hands. And it was really at this moment that I was thinking slavery in Canada, I never learned this and why didn't I learn this? And it was from taking Dr. Nelson's courses and reflecting on my education growing up in Quebec that I realized that this deliberate erasure of Canadian slavery really speaks to larger institutional systems that maintain national narratives of Canadian exceptionalism. And of course, one of these narratives is the Underground Railroad. So the network of routes, places, and people that helped enslaved people escape to free states in the US and Canada. And although this history is extremely important, the fact that it's often the closest we get to a discussion of Canadian slavery really perpetuates an image of Canada as a land of freedom, a new home for displaced loyalists, both white and black, and ultimately a place where runaway enslaved people from the US could find liberty. And this romanticization of the Underground Railroad has in turn caused many to ignore Canada's direct participation in the enslavement of Black and Indigenous peoples. And on top of this overt denial and really lack of education on Canadian slavery, Dr. Nelson and I further recognized during my undergrad how there's been little extensive archaeological research um, concerning enslaved people in Canada. And this is how my current master's research was born, which we'll dive into a bit now. So because I'm currently in the second year of my master's research, um, I'm still writing and exploring new topics, but today I'll be providing you all with an overview of my project as a whole, and I'll end by focusing on some specific case studies that illuminate my uh, thesis and research questions. So today I'll be talking about the following topics, so I'll just contextualize Canadian slavery briefly. I'll also discuss my master's thesis with an outline of my research questions, theory, and methodology. Then I'll go more into my archival and archaeological research and some of the preliminary data that I've collected on New Brunswick enslavers. Then I'll show you um, what integrating historical and archaeological research looks like and discuss some overviews, um, give an overview of case studies from New Brunswick. And lastly, I'll end with some concluding remarks on my next steps to my research, as well as the future of Canadian slavery archaeology. So to begin, I'll just contextualize Canadian slavery to better situate us all in my research. So when we talk about slavery in Canada, which was both a French and after 1763, a British colony, we're referring to what we know as today Ontario, Quebec, Newfoundland, PEI, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. Slavery began in Canada, or rather New France, while it was a French colony. New France stretched over a vast area from the Gulf of the St. Lawrence to Louisiana, and this territory was colonized by the French up until 1763, with the signing of the Treaty of Paris when New France was ceded to Great Britain and became a British colony. And on this map, you can just see um, the geographic scope of New France. And the first recorded enslaved Black person uh, in New France was a young boy from Madagascar who arrived in 1629, was sold to a French colonizer and received the name Olivier Lejeune. And when there was an increase of New France's population and a shift from extraction to settlement in the late 17th century, more labor was required to sustain the colony. And as a result in 1688, in, uh, sorry, 1688, Jacques René de Plisé, who was then the governor general of New France, requested to King Louis XIV if they could import Black enslaved people to uh, New France. And Louis XIV responded with this letter uh, that I've just quoted on the screen, and basically says that, yes, you can import um, enslaved Black people to Canada. However, um, he was questioning whether they would survive the temperate climate, so the cold climate of Canada. And this quote really reflects a commonly held and racist belief that Black people were only suited for tropical climates. And this belief uh, was really at the core of race science, where it was thought that each race was a product of a specific climate. The governor general reassured that the, uh, the king that winters in New France were similar to that of New England, um, so the northern U.S. states, where enslaved people are reported to have been doing fine. And so black slavery did grow in Canada, but at a slower pa uh, pace when, during the period of New France. And it was only in 1709 that an ordinance legalizing slavery was passed in New France, uh, which I've quoted on the screen here.
And slavery continued in Canada when the British conquered New France in 1760. And the Articles of Capit uh, Capitulation included a specific clause on enslavement in which French inhabitants would not lose their enslaved people under the British regime, which is also quoted on the screen here. However, there was no formal slave code regulating uh, slavery in British Canada besides the 1781 Act declaring that, quote, baptisms of slaves shall not, be ex shall not exempt them from bondage in Prince Edward Islands. And furthermore, there was only one anti-slavery law passed in 1793 in Upper Canada, which is present day Ontario, that banned the importation of uh, enslaved people and mandated that children born to enslaved females would be freed at the age of 25. Children born to uh, enslaved females were de facto enslaved, given that slavery throughout the uh, British Atlantic world was a matrilineal institution. There was no equivalent anti-slavery law or slave code that was formally passed in Lower Canada, so present-day Quebec, or Atlantic Canada, uh, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Labrador, unless slavery remained largely um, legally insecure and unstable in these regions. And this fostered an environment where the law could be easily manipulated to benefit enslavers in Lower and Atlantic Canada. And these enslavers came from all levels of Canadian society, and they treated Black and Indigenous enslaved people as their chattel, so this was as their movable personal property. They were commodities to be purchased, sold, and inherited. And the Slave Emancipation Act that freed enslaved people throughout the British Empire, which included Canada, was only passed in 1834. So though enslaved people are generally underrepresented in historical documents, scholars have made estimates to the number of enslaved people residing in Canada during both French and British rule. Specifically, scholars have suggested that approximately 4,200 enslaved people resided in New France and later Quebec between the late 1600s and 1834, of which one third were Black and two thirds were Indigenous. And under British rule, the number of Black enslaved people increased throughout Canada, primarily due to the influx of Loyalists uh, entering Canada following the American Revolutionary War in 1783. And the term loyalist refers to American colonists who remained loyal to the British crown. Many of them served under the British during the American Revolution, and they settled in what are now the provinces of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Quebec, and Ontario, and they brought with them a number of enslaved people. In fact, to encourage loyalist settlers to immigrate to Canada, the government passed the Imperial Statute of 1790, uh, which allowed them to bring uh, enslaved people, household furniture, uh, utensils, husbandry, and clothing duty-free. And by law, such chattels, so such movable property, um, could not be sold for one year after entering the colonies. And specifically, there are around 30,000 loyalists that settled in the Maritimes between 1783 and 1785. And it's been estimated that the, at the outset of a loyalist settlement in New Brunswick, between 1,500 and 2,000 enslaved people were forcibly brought to the Maritimes. And these numbers were likely higher given that the terms servant and slave were often used interchangeably. So for example, enslaved people entering Canada with loyalists were often referred to as servants in ship registries by their loyalist enslavers. And during this period, many enslaved people in the US also left their enslavers and fought on the side of uh, the British during the revolution. When the war was over, a number of free black loyalists moved to British North America, uh, sorry, moved to British Canada and an estimated 30,000, uh, sorry, 3,000 settled in Nova Scotia between 1783 and 1785, which included the provinces of New Brunswick up to, which included, sorry, the province of New Brunswick up to 1784 when the two um, formally separated. So this vague use of terminology between servant and slave combined with the frequent re-enslavement of free black peoples makes it diff difficult to discern in the archives exactly how many enslaved people resided in the Maritimes and Canada at large. And so given my geographic scope being New Brunswick and my time frame being from Loyalist period until emancipation, so 1783 to 1834, my research is truly centered on the 1,500 to 2,000 enslaved people who are forcibly brought to the Maritimes by their Loyalist enslavers. So what we presently know about the slave experience in Canada according to specialists in the field. So Canada did not have full-time enslaved field laborers, given that the climate could not sustain year-round plantations as in the Caribbean and American South. So more enslaved people were forced to work as domestic laborers and to do seasonal outdoor field and agricultural labor. 
there was also a handful of enslaved people who were trained as skilled tradesmen. So it's blacksmiths, printing press operators, seamstress, and so on. And due to limited commercial activities, Canada's temperate climate and other factors like provisions and profit, there was less of a demand for enslaved labor. So slave ships from, Caf from Africa did not go directly to Canada. Rather, black enslaved people often arrived on merchant ships from the Caribbean and British North American colonies as, prime, as sorry, secondary cargo alongside raw materials, which was the primary cargo, like rum, sugar, and molasses that were procured from their forced labor. Or they also arrived, as I've mentioned, with loyalists and slavers after 1783. Black people in Canada, black and slave people in Canada, therefore comprised of a diverse ethnic and cultural uh, background. Since the enslaved population was composed of African Canadians, African Americans, African Caribbeans, African born peoples, and Indigenous peoples. Enslaved people in Canada often lived in or near their enslavers' home and were both male and female. They catered to white families, whether it be cooking and cleaning for them or taking care of their children. Enslaved people, especially women working as domestics, were victims to numerous incidents, incidences of sexual exploitation, as well as physical and psychological violence and abuse, given their closer proximity to these white families. And evidence of violence inflicted upon the enslaved in Canada, from whippings to hangings, can be found in fugitive slave advertisements, court cases like that of Marie-Joseph Angelique, uh, which Amanda will be talking about next week, hospital records, letters, and through material objects like slave collars. For example, evidence of potential slave collars in New Brunswick suggests that enslavers in Canada use these items as a form of torture to prevent enslaved people from escaping successfully. And it's also important to account for differences in, term, in terms of slave labor, reproduction, and mortality in British North America, the American South, and the Caribbean. So sugar production in the Caribbean wasn't like cotton production in the South or seasonal field labor in Canada. In the Caribbean, sugar and rice were amongst the crops that were the most physically harmful and damaging to produce in the Atlantic world. And planters made calculated economic decision, decisions to work people in the Caribbean to death because it was cheaper and um, fulfilled more profit. So as a result, enslaved people in the Caribbean were dying faster than they could be produced due to br brutal working and living conditions. It was thus more profitable to keep importing enslaved people from Africa to maintain production on plantations. Whereas in British North America, enslaved people were reproduced naturally, although forcibly, and enslavers did not rely as heavily on the slave trade. In Canada, black enslaved women appear to have lived in a society of less concern with their ability to have children since there wasn't as strong of a demand for enslaved labor, though the sexual exploitation of black enslaved women still occurred in Canada which we can see from baptismal records that record a number of illegitimate enslaved children. This doesn't mean that enslaved people in British North America were treated more humanely than in the Caribbean, but that the enslaved in the Caribbean face certain kinds of violence in different materially deprived worlds than enslaved people in Northern and temperate regions. And the same can be said the other way around in which enslaved people in the US North and Canada experienced different forms of violence. So for example, enslaved people in Northern regions may have avoided the violence of plantation slavery in tropical zones, but they suffered from the extraordinary isolation from culture and community given the small population of enslaved people residing in these temperate zones. So in other words, given the slave minority population in Canada, isolation was a form of trauma that enslaved people likely experienced on a routine basis, which made the weaponization of family separation, so forcing enslaved families apart, um, even more traumatizing. And given these difficult living and working conditions, Black enslaved people in Canada had a life expectancy of approximately 25 and Indigenous enslaved people 17. However, slavery in Canada did defy easy generalizations. The typical experience of enslaved people in Canada consisted of working as domestics to maintain enslavers' households, grow their food, and raise their children. However, some achieved levels of literacy and tradesman skills, as well as opened successful businesses upon being freed or successfully resisting enslavement by escaping. So similarly, whereas many enslaved people were subject to regular beatings, others socialized and developed intimate yet fraught relationships with their enslavers, in which they were sometimes manumitted, so granted their freedom, um, later on in life or after their enslaver's death. And this is something we find uh, evidence of in wills. So the shared slave experience in Canada was oppressive and humiliating, in which enslaved people were forced to adapt um, uh, to a life they did not choose and could rarely control, though nuances can be found. 
So as the information I've just provided contextualizing slave, Canadian slavery suggests, several experts have written about enslavement in Canada through a critical analysis of primary sources. Some that come to mind include the works of Harvey Amani Whitfield, Dr. Nelson, uh, Frank Mackey, Ifua Cooper, Ken Donovan, Marcel Trudell, amongst several others that are listed on the slide. But unlike the United States, Caribbean, and South America, where archaeological research on sites, but primarily uh, plantations, of enslavement has been well explored. Within Canada, there have only been a handful of archaeological studies on slavery and the African diaspora concerning Black loyalists, free Black communities, and enslaved people in Nova Scotia and Ontario. So for instance, this gap of, uh, in terms of archaeological research has been partially addressed in Nova Scotia by historical archaeologists like Catherine Coutreau Robbins, Heather McLeod Leslie, uh, Stephen Davis, and Laird Neven, though currently most research in Nova Scotia has been concerned with free Black settlements. In Ontario, similar research has been completed by archaeologists like Carolyn Smart Frost concerning urban dwellings of escapees from American slavery. And it's only the historical archaeologist Catherine Coutreau Robbins, who has thus far worked specifically on a site of enslavement in Canada with a focus on slave quarters, um, where she actually examined the farmstead of a loyalist general named Timothy Ruggles in Annapolis County, Nova Scotia. In contrast, a lot more focused archaeological research concerning northern slavery has been completed in the U.S. North. Since the early um, 1940s, archaeologists studying the African diaspora in the U.S. have demonstrated that slavery was pervasive in the Northeast. Um, maybe the, the most, arguably the most well-known excavation concerning slavery in the U.S. North was the African Burial Ground Project in New York, though uh, archaeological research of slave quarters has been completed in New York, Long Island, Rhode Island, and several other places. Archaeological research and northern U.S. plantations has demonstrated that although it has been assumed that enslaved people in the north likely lived in the house of their enslavers, forced live in locked attics, garrets, and cellars, there was also uh, separate outbuildings used as slave quarters. And excavations of these slave quarters has produced fruitful data concerning the living conditions of the enslaved. So although the study of Canadian slavery is a burgeoning field that has recently been unsilenced and critically analyzed by historians, historical archaeologists have failed to consider their role in the field. And this lack of archaeological research on slavery in Canada has left many topics underexplored, such as the material realities of enslaved people, slave culture, uh, foodways, community bonds, working and living conditions, resistance, access to leisure, um, spatial organization, site diversity, and interactions with other groups, amongst many other things. And so this is where my uh, master's project comes in, since I suggest that these topics can be explored, not all, but some, uh, through historical archaeology and the study of slave quarters in New Brunswick. So what is historical archaeology? Uh, historical archaeology is the study of material remains of past societies that also left behind documentary and oral histories. These records can both complement and conflict with the archaeological evidence found at a particular site. And it's by examining the physical and documentary records of historic sites that historical archaeologists attempt to form new interpretations concerning a range of topics dealing with the everyday life uh, of people in the past. And here's just a photo of me uh, excavating in Maine this past summer. Uh, this wasn't a historical archaeological site, but it's just for demonstration purposes. And the second photo is of me looking at microfilms at the Provincial Archives of New Brunswick. So the idea is that these two really go hand in hand in historical archaeology. So my master's research will help to dismantle a piece of Canada's national narrative by locating, documenting, and analyzing slave quarters in New Brunswick through the examination of archival materials and by completing informal interviews, reconnaissance surveys, and uh, geographic information information system site mapping with a story map component, which I'll get to and define uh, in the next few slides. So this research will be an important contribution to new accounts of Canada's history that emphasize the enslaved experience as a strategy of decolonization and to recognize how the past has been mobilized to maintain this exceptionalism in the present. So my research will focus on these uh, research questions here. So by working comparatively with archival and archaeological records, how can locating, documenting, and analyzing slave quarters in New Brunswick inform us about the daily lives and living conditions of the enslaved in Canada, as well as their community and familial bonds? What can integrating historical archaeology, GIS, and story mapping tell us about the landscape in which the enslaved lived? And how did this landscape surrounding slave quarters in the general natural environment of New Brunswick affect enslaved people's labor, foodways, and movement? 
What can this research reveal of the distinct cultural identity of enslaved people in Canada and their connections to the Atlantic world? And what is the relevance of this research in relation to present issues of representation, power, racism, and inequality in Canadian society? So researching these questions is important because they'll contribute to providing more diverse archaeological evidence. They'll be more inclusive and representative of the histories of the African diaspora um, from which Canada has been largely ignored. And I approach my research through uh, Sadia Hartman's concept of critical fabulation. So critical fabulation involves a combination of historical and archival research that is substantiated with critical theory and fictional narrative. In short, Hartman critically reads the archive, pays attention to what is unsaid, and intends to tell an impossible story and to amplify the impossibility of its telling. Her goal is not to recover the lives of the enslaved, but to paint as full of a picture of their lives as possible. And this entails going beyond the limits of traditional historical methods, and instead using critical narrative to offer entry into the lives of the enslaved. An application of critical fabulation entails the rearranging of basic elements in a story to quote, jeopardize the status of an event, to displace the received or authorized account, and to imagine what might have happened, or it might have been said, or it might have been done. I suggest that critical fabulation can be further extended to my research because archival material and spatial evidence can be rearranged to represent divergent Canadian stories, in which I will seek to understand the relationship between what happened and what is said to have happened, and to consider the histories from the perspective of people in the slave quarters rather than the big house. So rather than only extending the boundaries of archival documents to speculate what might have happened, I argue that a close narration of enslaved people's lives can be critically uh, accessed by supplementing archival research with archaeological research that includes both material and geospatial evidence. So in doing so, my research will displace a small portion of authorized colonial accounts and reimagine the experience of slavery in New Brunswick from the perspective of the enslaved. And this narration of enslaved people's lives in New Brunswick will be illuminated in the mapping portion, portion of my research, which I'll discuss uh, a little bit later on. So this mapping will be combined geospatial analytics and the digital humanities to track enslaved people in a way that simultaneously highlights the dynamism of Black geographies and combats the cartographic erasure of Black bodies. So given my use of maps and engagement with spatial history and Black geographies to study the enslaved, my research is also informed by the works of Marissa J. Fuentes, Catherine McKeertrick uh, and Tiffany Lafabo King. So building from their research on the relationship between black people and geographies, I intend to challenge this cartographic disavowal of slavery and genocide by rewriting the black geographic presence of enslaved people in Canada, in which I'll digitally locate slave quarters and enslaved people in New Brunswick using maps. And in the Canadian context, black and indigenous enslaved people have been despatialized and deemed ungeographic. As such, my work attempts to reinscribe um, their livingness onto a colonial cartographic landscape that has traditionally and consistently erased them. And it's precisely this geographic refusal of slavery's presence in Canada that allows for one to critically fabulate and re-spatialize the experiences of enslaved people in New Brunswick. Using these theories requires a reflection on my pos positionality as well. So as a white woman, uh, and first generation Canadian, it's necessary that I'm aware of the ethical debates within Black studies concerning critical theories, which will continue to frame my research as I decide how to move forward and write about the Black experience in Canada, and if that means not writing those certain aspects of all, at all. So one statement that I can confidently make is that my positionality matters, and I should use it to situate myself in my research rather than pretend to be this neutral observer, which means recognizing that I will never live or understand the Black experience. And now uh, a discussion of my archival and archaeological research and preliminary data. So what sources will help me answer my research questions and how am I using them? So to begin locating slave quarters in New Brunswick's loyalist landscape, I carefully read the works of William Renwick Waddell, Thomas Watson, W.A. Sprain, Harvey Money Whitfield, and made note of all known enslavers, both loyalists and not, uh, in New Brunswick, and when specified the number of enslaved people they owned. Afterwards, I used Nova Scotia Archive searchable online database of the Book of Negroes to record all loyalist enslavers bound for St. John, Nova Scotia in 1783, which is present day St. John, New Brunswick. From here, I cross referenced the loyalist enslavers I had recorded from the Book of Negroes and the works described above to determine how many enslaved people each loyalist brought with them to New Brunswick. And I added to this list, list of enslavers by using um, resources at the Provincial Archives of New Brunswick, which I'll just call a PAND from now on. 
And I use the early New Brunswick probates database as well as a few others to record um, New Brunswick enslavers, uh, their enslaved people and their estates. So based on the, this archival research and data collected from Riddell, Smith, Spray, and Whitfield, I made an extensive table in Excel of 100, over 100 enslavers in New Brunswick with an estimate of how many enslaved people they each owned. And based on preliminary research, the data in this graph shows that most had at least one or two enslaved people. But my research is really more concerned with those who owned two or more enslaved people since the likelihood of them having separate slave quarters increases as seen in the US North. So as seen in this graph, approximately 29 enslavers owned at least two or more enslaved, owned two, uh, sorry, more than two enslaved people. So from here, I used Whitfield's publications to locate and digitize all relevant material pertaining to these 29 enslavers that directly mentioned their enslaved people. So this included digitizing materials such as fugitive slave ads, sale ads, court documents, wills, bills of sale, newspaper articles, um, and et cetera, and to analyze these. So after I completed this research, I made note of these 29 enslavers with two or more enslaved people. And I recognized that those that had the most archival material uh, included loyalists. So while it's important to recognize and challenge this idea that even if slavery did exist in Canada, it was brought from uh, the US following the Revolutionary War, I chose to focus on New Brunswick loyalists for my master's thesis, given my uh, page limit. And also uh, because they had the most substantial archival evidence attesting to enslaved people in their possession and on their land. So from this list of 29, I selected 11 uh, loyalist enslavers from whom I researched more closely. Um, and these are those listed in the amount of enslaved people they owned on the table. And from here, I digitized all the land petitions, land grants and probate records of these 11 loyalist enslavers to locate their land in New Brunswick and to determine when possible why they wanted land and what they did with this land, which could have ranged from agricultural and farm work to building a church amongst, amongst other things. And I chose to use these documents of land grants and petitions and deeds and probates to access information concerning the daily lives of enslaved people as well as their living and working conditions. So for example, land petitions often describe what the loyalists intended to do with the land that would be granted to them from the king. And this can include using the land to build a mill, uh, agricultural fields, or a house for their eight enslaved children. And from this information, we can infer that the enslaved people of this loyalist likely worked at the mill and the field and as a domestic uh, for the loyalist's eight children. Similarly, probate inventories can reveal where enslaved people lived, as well as speak to their material realities. Um, so for instance, it may state that the deceased grants their enslaved people their bed and linen that they've used for the last five years. And after collecting all this archival material, I parsed my list of 11 down to about half, given the scope of my thesis. And I made my decision based on a careful and critical reading of the archival material I've digitized. And by first considering which loyalists likely had slave quarters, and second, which of these loyalist sites has the most potential for future archeological research. And based on preliminary research, which is still changing and recently changed and will likely change again, um, I've selected Jacob Elgoods, Jonathan O'Dell, Joseph Clark, Stair Agnew, Caleb Jones, and John Coffin. So after sorting through the archival material required for my research, I, re I recently begun the archeological portion, um, which includes locating the land and property of loyalists and slavers using a range of archeological records, cadastral maps, reconnaissance surveys, and GIS. So uh, in terms of archeological methodology, Reconnaissance is a method used by archaeologists to locate new sites and to investigate the details of known sites without excavation. It's often the first uh, method used in research. Uh, sorry, the, it, this was the first type that I used in my research, which was a desktop study. So a desktop reconnaissance involves analyzing maps and historical or archaeological documents concerning the area under investigation to locate potential slave quarters. And this research involved using cadastral maps, land grants, probate records, deeds, land petitions, newspaper correspondences, and oral accounts to locate loyalists and slavers' property and potential slave quarters. And on the uh, slide, I just include some definition of these documents. And another method uh, used in desktop reconnaissance is geographic information uh, systems or GIS. So GIS are powerful databases containing geographic data 
in which researchers use software tools to manage, analyze, and visualize different types of data, such as topography, geology, and vegetation, to name a few. And the specific database that I'm using is called ArcMap. So in ArcMap, I've imported data from GeoNV. So this is uh, the province of New Brunswick's uh, database for ge all geographic information relating to the province. And I've specifically imported GeoNV's uh, Crown Grant reference data that has all the cadastral maps of New Brunswick uh, already overlaid or georeferenced on top of contemporary satellite imagery of New Brunswick. And it's using this archival and geospatial material that I've begun the process of determining where the six uh, loyalist, selected loyalists and slavers owned land and started to trace exactly the boundaries and ownership of this land. And it's by tracing these boundaries on cadastral maps that are overlaid on top of satellite imagery that I'll be able to determine if original features remain intact, if it is surrounded by new buildings, what the surrounding environment look, looks like, and what if this proper, sorry, property is suitable for reconnaissance surface surveys. So surface surveys is another method that I use in my research. Um, specifically, I hope to complete field walking surface surveys of the land previously owned by loyalist enslavers. And this includes, um, what this is is archeologists, another kind of first step in their research, it's to find traces of unrecorded sites. So during surface surveys, archeologists walk around a potential site looking for building rubble or artifacts or slight undulations in the surface that can reveal where buried features might be. And I also argue that beyond just locating slave quarters and analyzing their potential for archeological research, it would be useful and advantageous to simultaneously document where enslaved people resided in New Brunswick through a story map. So story mapping is a method for arranging stories on a digital platform to create a more holistic view of how they fit into an overall experience. Story mapping uses technology to digitally combine maps, archival material, text, images, multimedia, and interactive components as an alternative way to represent information and to convey a narrative. And this type of visualization and spatial history grants people new abilities to engage with and communicate their data across disciplines. And I suggest that Doing this with a small group of enslaved people through a story map can shed light on their individual experience of slavery and how they fit into a larger narrative of Canadian slavery. Um, so it can reveal patterns concerning their daily lives, like mobility in rural and urban spaces, their living conditions, cultural identity, community bonds, and so on. So in short, maps will help me to identify sites, connections, and simultaneous events that tend to remain hidden, hidden in diagrams and tables. And another reason why I want to make a story map for my thesis is that I want to disseminate my research in an accessible and public format. So the story map will help visualize the pervasiveness, pervasiveness of slavery and use case studies to not only illustrate this enslaved experience in Canada, but also the diversity of it, these experience. So it's my goal with my thesis is to place enslaved people back into a historical and geographic context from which their experiences have been largely erased. So what does integrating historical and archeological research with digital mapping to locate slave quarters in New Brunswick actually look like? Um, so it looks something like this. So this is a map I made locating and documenting the land of four loyalist enslavers in York and Sunbury County on cadastral maps using land grants and New Brunswick County deed registry books. So to see the deeds uh, are to see where this land, uh, sorry, when loyalist enslavers bought land uh, from other people who are noted on the cadastral maps. So the cadastral ma maps are uh, up to date with when you purchased land from someone else, but more necessarily when you're granted land from the king. And for the sake of time, I'll only briefly discuss four of the six selected enslavers for my master's thesis. Um, and the discussion, sorry, and the decision was made somewhat for me uh, when I was make making these maps on who I could talk about today, since these four enslavers fit perfectly onto one map. Um, so here we can see in yellow the land of Jonathan O'Dell in York County, which is also displayed in the bottom corner. Um, and this is a zoomed in layer of his land in Fredericton. In blue, we have Joseph Clark's land in Majorville, Sunbury County. And on the other side of Fredericton, we have Caleb Jones land in green and Sarah Agnew's land in pink, both in York County. And now here is the same map, but with the cadastral map layer turned off. Oopsies. There we go. But with the cadastral map layer turned off to reveal the contemporary satellite imagery of York and Sunbury County um, and where the land of these loyalist enslavers would be today. 
So this is only one map that I'm kind of using more generally to demonstrate how I'm doing my research and to show the proximity of enslavers and enslaved people in a relatively small space. But what I'll be doing with this data is analyze, analyzing each individual enslaver's um, land from the satellite imagery on ArcMap to determine if it can be uh, surface surveyed, what features are there, if the, what the surroundings were like, if there were agricultural fields, uh, amongst other things. And just briefly, I'll kind of talk about these four loyalist enslavers and why I selected them and what questions I'm thinking of when I'm analyzing their land. So first we have Jonathan Odell. Um, Odell was a loyalist from New Jersey who came to New Brunswick and resigned as a surgeon to become an Anglican priest. He is said to have owned at least two unnamed enslaved people that lived in the L or extension of his house, also, which was also known as the deanery in Fredericton. This extension can be seen on the right, uh, sorry, in the picture uh, with the red arrow. Um, and it's reported, it was reported that it was used as slave quarters according to newspaper records. And these newspaper records, which I've um, used their titles on the screen here, uh, note that there were also chains and rings in the wall of the extension that were possibly used to lock up the enslaved. Unfortunately, the extension was torn down in 1959 and only the main house remains, though it is possible that archeological material also remains, uh, which is why I've chosen this site for my study at the moment. Furthermore, Jonathan Odell owned a farm known as Rockwood, which is current, which currently sits at Odell Park. So I'm thinking through did enslaved people uh, labor on his farm in Odell Park and what were they doing uh, living in the extension of Odell's main house? Were they doing domestic labor? So on and so forth. And as seen in these newspaper articles, there was even debate around the destruction of the slave quarters and questions of whether they existed at all which reflects the pervasiveness of the myth that slavery did not exist in Canada. Um, it was from these newspaper articles discussing Odell's property that I also came across another potential site known as the Barker House. So the Barker House was Stair Agnew's 1,000 acre homestead uh, located at Barker's Point in York County. Agnew was, uh, and this is um, just like a zoom up of the satellite imagery and where his land would be today. Agnew, um, Agnew's home was built around 1790 and the property on which his house was built is said to have fields of vegetation, barns and mills on which his enslaved people worked. And although Agnew's house uh, was dismantled in 1954 to build a motel, it is possible that remains of separate slave quarters can maybe be found on these 1000 acres or on another 1000 acres that he purchased from a pre-loyalist settler. Um, at the mouth of the Nashwalk River. So according to his land petition and grant, he wanted this land to operate ferries across the Nashwalk and St. John Rivers, and they called this estate Moncton. So is it possible that as enslaved people were being forced to work at these ferries? What was their labor like? How did this affect their daily lives uh, and their general conditions? So these are questions that I'm still working through. And then we have Joseph Clark. So Clark owned at least five enslaved people whose lives have been recorded to somewhat of a greater extent than most enslaved people in Canada, given that several court cases were brought against Clark. Clark was born in Connecticut in 1734 and became a surgeon. Uh, when the Revolutionary War break, broke out, he remained loyal to Britain and fled to New Brunswick with his wife and eight children in 1783, where he remained a surgeon. Clark entered New Brunswick with four servants, uh, although this didn't include Stasia and her family. Um, who are uh, recorded in the fugitive slave advertisement that I have on the screen. So Stasia ran away with Dick Hopewell, who was an indented servant and her children on June 9, 1792. And she and her children were enslaved. Um, and they're just some of the enslaved people that Joseph Clark owned. Further information concerning Stasia's family and where they lived, um, if they were recaptured and separated can be gleaned from court cases. So court documents concerning the habeas corpus case of uh, her son, Richard Hopefield Jr., who was also owned by Sarah Agnew afterwards in 1805. And this is just a summary of the case uh, on the other side of the screen from uh, newspapers, the Borough Gazette in New Brunswick. So I'm questioning what labor were his enslaved people completing? Were they forced to help with his medical practices or take care of his eight children? Did they farm? Did they live in the same house with his whole family? What would have this looked like if they did? And if they didn't, where were they living? And lastly, we have Caleb Jones. 
So he was an American planter and slave owner in Maryland who fled to New York with the outbreak of the American Revolutionary War. There he served as a captain in the war and explored the land of New Brunswick, where he was granted uh, land on the Nashwaukee stream near St. Anne's Point, present day Fredericton, and he took up farming. Jones was arguably involved in the most important slavery related legal case in New Brunswick, and I'm sure uh, some of you are aware of the case regarding the right of habeas corpus for his enslaved woman named Nancy. And just in short, the New Brunswick Supreme Court could not reach a majority uh, opinion and she was returned in, uh, to Jones. And as seen in this fugitive slave ad that I have on the screen, Jones owned at least four other enslaved people besides Nancy, who likely completed agricultural and outdoor field labor on his farm. But what was his farm like? What would have this labor looked like? And what factors uh, did this labor play in the living conditions of the enslaved people? What were the surrounding environments like? How did this maybe facilitate or hinder escape and so on? And just some concluding remarks and my next steps in the future of Canadian slavery archaeology. Now that I've located and documented the land of these loyalist enslavers, I'll complete a close analysis of the present state of the land uh, from the satellite imagery on ArcMap. After I'll analyze the satellite imagery alongside land grants, petitions, and other relevant archival material like fugitive slave ads to get a sense of what labor the enslaved people were completing. I'll also study closely the landscape and natural environment surrounding these slave quarters and how this informs uh, us on their daily lives. After I'll try and complete some surface surveys of the land, and this is possible sometimes without permission in some instances, for example, Caleb Jones property, uh, some of it is part of a public park, park that I was able to visit with another grad student at UNB, while well, I still need to ask and seek permission for the other properties. And lastly, I'll have um, to complete the story map portion of my research uh, using Esri GIS story mapping software. So since the enslaved uh, people in my research likely lived in small groups in separate slave quarters, each group of enslaved people will have their own story map. And within these group story maps, each person will have chronological subsections alongside relevant archival material dealing, uh, detailing their movement, biography, and key events in their life, like escape, sale, separation, death, and et cetera. And my intention after my master's is to complete a PhD in historical archaeology, where I can engage in community archaeology at these potential slave quarter sites that I've documented and analyzed. So community archaeology encourages and prioritizes descendant participants to form their own interpretations on the archaeological record. And so I want to work directly with descendant communities and combine their knowledge with this archival and archaeological evidence to get uh, information on what enslaved people daily lives were like in New Brunswick and to also share this information with others. So further archaeological research at the slave quarter sites that I've described would be really significant and give us a lot of new information on the intricacies of slavery in Canada. Um, so for example, depending on what artifacts are unearthed, Excavations could provide information of food ways and diet by analyzing ceramics and animal bones. And this can also indicate uh, distinct cultural practices in Canada, relationships between groups of items are being traded and so on. But really to get at more advanced archeological research in the field, we first need to locate slave quarters in Canada. And my master's research will only address a portion of this gap by documenting and analyzing where a small selection of enslaved people lived in New Brunswick. So there's still a lot of research that needs to be done and I'm really happy to answer any questions you may have. And I thank you all for being here. Wonderful, Emily, thank you so much for that really wonderful presentation. Um, I'm just gonna uh, have a couple comments and then I'm gonna kick it off and hand it over to, to um, the attendees. And thank you all for being here again for the first uh, presentation of Slavery North. I just wanted to reiterate what Emily said is so powerful uh, using the concepts, Emily used the concepts of black geogra geographic presence and livingness of blackness and why that's so important for the Canadian context specifically. And I know you articulated this very ably, but there's a particular hypocrisy in Canada around the relationship of Canada to transatlantic slavery histories, which again, as Emily ably articulated have been uh, profoundly erased. And what that's resulted in, though, is a displacement or what you can call an unhoming of Black Canadian populations. And what that looks like today for us on the ground is that we're constantly being asked by our fellow white Canadian citizens, where are we from? And they're not expecting us to say Saskatoon or Toronto or Halifax. They're expecting us to name a nation outside of Canada. And part of that, again, is if you have no knowledge of a 200-year history 
of Canadian slavery under two colonies, under two empires, excuse me, the Fr French and the British, then you have no sense that what your, um, your Black Canadian fellow citizen might respond to a question of where are you from is that I am seventh generation African Nova Scotian, for instance, okay? So that knowledge of a long Black Canadian presence has been lost with the erasure of this history that Emily so ably articulates. So that's so important. So Emily, if we could take you back to the beginning first, and if you can, um, I know you covered this quite a bit, but if you can articulate for us, why New Brunswick, okay? Because I know part of it might just be like, you're in New Brunswick and you start to work in the archive and we're fascinated that way. So we want to hear that. And why loyalists? Because again, as you articulated, there's other uh, slavery histories pre-loyalists, pre-1760, 1780, et cetera. So why New Brunswick, why loyalists? And also, can you give us a sense of what was a typical, is there a typical land grant? Like how many acres are we talking for these people that you are zeroing in on? Oops, there we go. Yeah, fantastic. So first, why I chose New Brunswick? Well, originally my research was going to be New Brunswick and Quebec. Um, but since my master's thesis, it's a lot shorter. And to think realistically, I kind of decided to choose where I would be studying. So I'm studying in New Brunswick. And I realized that by working at the provincial archives of New Brunswick, I gained so many skills. And it was just a lot easier for me to do archival research having worked there. And I also chose New Brunswick. Um, rather than another maritime province, just because there's already been, to some extent, some research done in Nova Scotia. So I wanted to frame my research in a way that was like, there hasn't been anything done in New Brunswick. And then the second question, which I've already forgot, why New oh, Brunswick? Oh, sorry, so why loyalists? <laughs> why, oh, why, why loyalists? loyalists? There we go. Courage. Yeah, so is there yeah. something specific to the loyalists, you think, in terms of your archeological focus? that yeah. you wouldn't find with other earlier, let's say, slave owners. Mm -hmm. um, so with, in terms of why I selected loyalists, I, as I mentioned in the archaeological and the archival aspect, it's just because they had some of the most uh, extensive archival evidence that I could find that attested to their land. So the land that they owned. And I also selected loyalists and slavers because they were already coming from the US with this um, plantation or planters or enslavers mentality. So how were they maybe reinscribing this type of mentality in New Brunswick? And what did this look like? So were there plantations from, let's say, I think it's, um, uh, might be Caleb. Caleb Jones is Maryland, but then there's one of them I'm forgetting right now is Virginia. So were they, the plantations that they had on Virginia, were they trying to reinscribe and redo kind of the same foundations here in New Brunswick? And is this maybe more evidence in the archeological record by these separate slave quarters since they already had these ideas coming to Canada? Okay, and so, then, sorry, no, please continue. Yes, no, 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 that, that was it. I was gonna go to the next question, but. <laughs> okay, no, because you said yeah. something really important there um, to articulate for everybody that what you're saying then is most of them were planters or defined themselves as planters prior to moving north, right? Yeah. And were yeah. from the mid-Atlantic or the or South sure. Atlantic, right? And yeah. sorry, someone, someone, can you please mute? Uh, there's someone that we can hear in the background. So um, I'm wondering then, Emily, so mm -hmm. if we have this group of planters moving to a temperate climate they're unfamiliar mm -hmm. with, um, how can you start to think through what other remnants materially might be there on the ground once you start the archaeological phase of your research at the PhD level mm -hmm. besides the slave quarters, right? So yeah. if trying, and, and what would they have thought they could reconstitute in Canada, but they got there and like, no, can't happen here, too cold, can't break earth in, yeah. in December. Like, have you started yeah. to think through what, what that might look like? Yeah, so like um, one idea that just kind of pops to mind is maybe they were the crops that they were producing. So maybe the crops that they were producing um, in the U.S. in these uh, more tropical, not really tropical, but like hot climates, um, if they try to then reproduce these crops in Canada. So you can look at macro botanical remains. So you can look at um, the remains of crops from the past in the present in Canada and to see maybe if they were trying to reproduce the same crops, what that labor then to produce these crops would have been like in Canada. So this would include looking more at 
the agricultural fields and the farm fields that some of them might have had. Um, or like uh, Joseph Clark was still a surgeon here. So was he maybe try? this is not really archaeological, this is more of a, an aside, I guess, but was he trying to use enslaved people um, as subjects for his patients for studies and, and whatnot? So these are like other things that I'm kind of thinking through, but in terms of the archaeological record, you can also think of ceramics. So maybe enslaved, they, they brought ceramics or um, different utensils with them from the US to Canada, and we could find those remains here and so on. Wonderful. Or, or food yeah. waste, food, like diet practices from the US and Canada. Right, right. The evidence might still be there. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. So I want to open up to our wonderful audience. If there's anybody who wants to ask Emily a question, you can unmute and unmic. If you're having trouble with that, you can type it into the chat. If you have a question, don't be shy. I'm sure Emily will take all kinds of questions. And we understand at Slavery North that um, there is not a broad um, understanding of these histories, especially in the lay communities and even in academic communities. I think uh, Chris has a question. Chris, I, are you I, there? Can you I can, he can say it or I can read oh, it. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll read it. I'll read it. Thank you, Chris. Okay. So, Chris, you want to go ahead and read it? Uh, sure, I'll try. I have some internet issues, but just sort okay. of. Um, yeah, I, I like obviously some enslaved might have lived in slave quarters if there was quite a few of them, but I also know some sort of northern enslavers had them sort of, uh, for example, I know uh, a few cases where they were actually sort of residing in the cellar mm -hmm. of the of the house. And so just sort of like, if you know of, or um, maybe this is also sort of going back to those other uh, fragments that you might find if, if there isn't a slave quarter, maybe like what where did they live and maybe how did they repurpose other spaces mm -hmm. for living in these in these places yeah actually um one of the enslavers that i had selected previously that made the short list that i'm not sure what i'm, I'm doing yet with uh, is uh reverend scoville so he was the reverend for the anglican trinity church uh and i believe it was king's county don't don't quote me on that but in New Brunswick, and it's recorded that he actually, in the basement of the rector of the church, uh, held enslaved people. So evidence of chains and slave collars. Uh, I know that there's been um, that this has been found there. Um, and then there's also, I believe, Stair Agnew. There was uh, somewhere in the archival record or in this secondary source. I can't remember exactly where it was. Uh, where there was uh, he used attics. So his attic to house enslaved people. So there's also, um, there could be both slave quarters and maybe um, places where they were living inside of uh, enslavers' houses, like cellars or attics and basements. For sure. Thank you, Emily. And thank you for that, Chris. And just to follow up on that too, we have that Quebec ad placed by Judah Joseph for the enslaved woman, Chloe, and where is she escaping from? The garret, which is mm -hmm. the attic ab right above the two-story home. And then, mm -hmm. as Chris said, sellers. And then Frank Mackey, whose work, of course, you know, Emily, in the book um, Done with Slavery, lists an inventory where the enslaved man, I believe, was listed as being in the cabin on the property. Mm -hmm. So again, so all these places to look and then think through to what are the primary sources that can supplement the archaeological work that lead us to that. So in one case, mm -hmm. a fugitive slave ad, in the other case, an estate inventory, right? Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions or comments for Emily? And again, you can unmute and unmic if you want, or you can type it in the chat. Okay, so while we're waiting for you all to jump in, Emily, here's a big one. <laughs> I know you've been thinking about this a lot because I, I just read your brilliant um, thesis outline. So after you know, beginning to delve into this literature of um, trans-like slavery, archaeology research um, and some of it specific to slavery in the temperate regions which you shared with us thank you so much for that for orienting us to what's been happening in Canada and it's so fascinating that so many of the our few archaeologists have focused on free black settlements as a compared to the one you said who's focused on um, an enslaved black settlement 
But what do you believe then, Emily, is unique to the discipline of archaeology in terms of what you'll be able to recover or uncover in comparison to the traditional archival research alone? So what is it about archaeology that where we need to push forward and build on um, Canadian slavery archaeology? Yeah, I think that um, given my background in anthropology and when we were talking in my undergrad about this kind of lack of research, what really came to mind was how we can use the material record to gain insights into the lives of enslaved people um, who are only known through archival fragments that were written from the perspective of white enslavers and to kind of think around ways that we can maybe access more information of the enslaved experience from their um, lived life. So how they were living and this idea, I remember uh, talking about their diet, how we just don't really know what enslaved people were eating in Canada. Um, and I think that a way to study this archeologically is to look at their surrounding environments and the land that they were using and to excavate these sites um, to look at maybe uh, the food that they were cooking through ceramics. So you can like do chemical tests on ceramics to see what types of food they were producing. And we just wouldn't have access to this information in the archives um, that we know of right now, at least. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, there's just so many other aspects to it or their movement in urban and rural spaces. So we can look at a fugitive slave ad and okay, they're telling us that they think that they're running here or that they left from this place to go here. Um, but to actually look at this land and to even calculate how long that walk would have been, that walk could, was likely seven days, right? And to use maps and um, to do analysis of maps in this way to really get at the slave experience uh, in a way that's different than the archives, since the archives is really just recording small portions of their life that um, are very useful, but I feel like the archeological record can just offer maybe more of a fine-tuned focus or scope on aspects of their daily lives that we don't really know yet. Excellent, thank you. And you have a thank you from Nicole Hughes who, who says she's sorry she has to run, but thank you for a great presentation. Um, I was wondering too about, you know, when you're thinking through archeology, span I think when you talk about reconnaissance, a lot is not mm -hmm. just about the what you find, but the where mm -hmm. you find it, right? Mm -hmm. And especially in terms of you showed us some of the, what would have been called in Jamaica, the great house or what been, would have been called in the US South, the big house. You're mm -hmm. showing us the houses where the loyalist lives, which mm -hmm. sometimes were the homes where the enslaved live and sometimes not if you're gonna find yeah. quarters. So I'm thinking of a study, um, archeological study that I believe was done in Medford, Massachusetts on, um, um, the site of an enslaver's home called Royal House. Mm -hmm. And in that dig, Emily, they found objects that could be, you know, they were defined as leisure objects of the enslaved people, things that looked like games and toys. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, they found them all on the side of the slave quarters facing away from the mm -hmm. big house, mm -hmm. right? So what does that tell you too about surveillance in terms yeah. of the proximity of the two, the slave quarters to the big house and the enslaved people understanding that they were being watched Mm -hmm. And that leisure time was something that was not existent for them or something that they had to literally take. Yeah, right? exactly. So can you talk us through anything you started to, to, to think in terms of placement and the, and the where of, mm -hmm. of the materiality and the material cultural remnants that you yeah. uh, find or that other people have found? Yeah, actually. Um, so uh, I think Graham Nickerson was on the talk before, but he had to go because he had another meeting. But we actually went and we went to uh, the property of Caleb Jones because uh, it's a public park the, right on the river. And just also being in that uh, landscape and that natural environment and seeing where enslaved people were living has a profound impact. And to think that um, maybe just looking over the other side of the St. John River to Fredericton is like, okay, that's somewhere I can go to escape or um, thinking where the house would have been and the remains that would have been in the house if it was close to the river um, or if it was on top, well, if the enslaver's house was on top, more on elevated land and the slave quarters were on lower land, how this may have factored into an idea of surveillance and also um, maybe even material culture surrounding the house. Um, 
sorry, maybe even material culture surrounding the house. So there's even like this where they were disposing of their garbage. Like that's another thing that I'm thinking of. So um, in if they had separate slave quarters, what were they disposing their garbage and what was their garbage? Was their garbage just their food? And uh, and there's like a slew of other things that you can consider. Wonderful. From like Thank the material you. record, yeah. Material, right, right. In terms of placement and object, mm -hmm. the actual objects, materiality, et cetera. Okay, mm -hmm. and how that would distinct and be different from what's the planter's family or the loyalist, the white loyalist family is leaving behind. Okay, yeah. excellent. We have a question from the audience from David. Um, the question is, I was also wondering, what are the ways in which you believe engaging with the local community may help guide you to certain discoveries and or help you better understand the discoveries of this research? Is that something you are considering? Yes, <laughs> that's a fantastic question. Um, the sort of an answer is yes. So I think that community archaeology is a great way um, to not only disseminate information to the public, but to also gain new perspectives and interpretations of material. So being a white woman, analyzing these slave quarter sites and studying them, um, I don't think that my interpretations alone can account for the history of the African diaspora. So I think that having diasporic communities and descendant communities come in and also look at this material, form their own interpretations that are very enlightening probably to me because I don't, my ancestors um, are white and were the settlers rather than the enslaved. It's important to understand from their perspectives, what their information, uh, what their oral history as well. I think oral history is a big factor, uh, especially in New Brunswick. Um, there's a lot of uh, black elders in the community and um, people who are engaged, like uh, Marie Louise McCarthy comes to mind, and people who are engaging in um, black history in the province who have um, this long tradition of oral history that uh, is something that I don't have access to and that I um, don't, that they can use to help form interpretations of this material that even if that means that I don't get to hear these stories, that that's something that I respect from them and that they can use that information uh, the way they please with the archeological record. Thank you, David, and thank you, Emily. That's such a great point too, especially, I mean, I think something that people wouldn't necessarily understand unless they've lived in the Maritimes in Canada is that the African Canadian maritime populations have a really rich oral history tradition and they uh, very much know the different uh, family trees, the family names, and can um, connect and decipher each other just on the basis of a last name. So those, those histories and traditions have been preserved. And absolutely, um, working alongside them, working with them is going to yield a lot of fruitful, I think, outcomes. So that's wonderful. Uh, another question um, from Chris. OK. Not being too well versed in archaeology, hearing that properties may be situated beside rivers and other geographic features, is there any concern for historical floods or other phenomenon and how that may have impacted the settlement mm -hmm. and the preservation of artifacts? Thank you, Chris. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I think that my experience over the summer working in coastal Maine can kind of help me answer this question. <laughs> so uh, even there's even coastal erosion, right? So of remnants of sites eroding into the into the ocean. And this is something that happens a lot in archaeology. And this is why we have a lot of salvation archaeology. So going to these sites to get us to collect the material, study the material in a way um, before it gets lost in the ocean forever. So there are ways that um, I could study this using GIS. So if for, for example, um, slave quarters are located like right on the bank of the river. Uh, there are some GIS programs where I can look at the topography over time in New Brunswick. So that's something that uh, I should and I could consider and I will consider. Um, but it's it is difficult. So you can survey a whole site uh, or a, a whole part of uh, land and not find anything and it could just be lost in the water and we don't know about it. And then there's also marine archaeology. So those are archaeologists that go and do underwater archaeology. Um, often with boats. So there's quite a few on slave ships, um, but there are instances where maybe this could be done to locate artifacts that were lost in the water, um, which is a really, really sad, especially because the environment sort of disproportionately affects uh, these Black and Indigenous communities that in the past were settling on the river. Um, so 
global warming is also a, a big factor in that. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Emily. And that is such an important question too. After living in Nova Scotia for two years, and specifically, I, I, we were living in the town of Dartmouth, which is called the city of lakes. And that's no joke, mm -hmm. there's water everywhere. It made me really rethink the geography of escape too. And I know you're relying on fugitive slave ads as well, Emily, and thinking mm -hmm. through what is the knowledge, the local geographical knowledge that an enslaved person would have had to possess to even attempt an escape. And I'm not saying that New Brunswick geography is exactly the same, but yeah. there's a lot of like, you know, a lot of rivers and bodies of water where in the mm -hmm. maps you showed us too. So what did that look like? Because I know you're interested too in the mobility and immobility mm -hmm. of the slave. So thank you, Chris. Exactly. Um, okay, we'll go to a last question from Anthony Bell. Hi, Anthony. Hi, how are you guys doing? Um, great presentation, Emily. Thank uh, you. Yeah, no worries. Um, so my, my question was, um, you know, in what ways do you think that these archaeological practices and, you know, these material histories of slavery, you know, can better help us understand the transnational nature of slave societies and, you know, kind of this trend of like resistance to bondage? And mm -hmm. then do you think they can kind of provide us with a better understanding of these histories rather than like, you know, say grappling with uh, colonial archives? And I have another question after that, if I could also. Yes, jump. absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, Anthony. fantastic. I'll, I'll tackle the the um the first one first <laughs> so for my research um i think that there's a lot that can be done on enslaved people's relationship throughout the wider atlantic world by studying uh, these slave quarter sites so if a uh, material was being traded amongst groups or if different um black enslaved people from cultural backgrounds are residing in Canada. Like I mentioned, there's people coming from the Caribbean, from Africa. Uh, there's uh, indigenous enslaved people, people coming from uh, American states in the US, that all of these different cultural practices and ideas of creolization uh, are also present in Canada. And I think that the material record can help us uh, trace some of these connections in a way that can't really be done in the uh, archival record. So if we're finding, um, uh, I'm just going to use ceramic again for an example, a ceramic uh, that could have been brought or smuggled from an enslaved purpose, from an enslaved person from, um, let's say, the Caribbean. They got on the ship. They were enslaved in Canada, uh, in the U.S. Sorry. Then they were brought from the U.S. to Canada, and they brought with them these ceramics with them the whole time. I think that we can also besides just looking at the enslaved people, we can also look at their material culture in a way that provides knowledge on their relationship with the Atlantic world. And I think that also by using story maps to look at their movement within the Atlantic world um, is another way that we can look at these uh, transnational connections um, between enslaved people in uh, the Caribbean, the US and Canada. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> No, yeah, it definitely does. It was definitely a long one. Um, <laughs> as I apologize if it, if it was a bit too complex, but um, uh, I also was wondering, you know, with your, uh, you know, with your work in the New Brunswick archives, did you, and this is purely just out of, out of my, out of my own interest and, you know, kind of mm -hmm. trying to do, um, did you see anything that, that, you know, made reference to legislation on slavery in, in, uh, in New Brunswick? Yeah. So, um, there's really great article by uh, David Bell and uh, on New Brunswick and also Barry Cahill in um, Nova Scotia. But in David Bell's article, he really talks about the legal instability of slavery in New Brunswick and how there wasn't really a law legislating slavery, but there also wasn't a law not legislating slavery. And in this way, like this legal instability could benefit enslavers and enslaved people. So, um, in the Nova Scotia case, there's cases where they said, oh, well, there's no legislated slave uh, law, and they ended up manumitting or being granted their freedom enslaved people. Whereas in New Brunswick, like with the case of Nancy um, and uh, Richard Hopefield Jr., they went with habeas corpus cases, but they weren't granted this because the court couldn't uh, decide on whether slavery was or wasn't legal. And so they just remained enslaved. So they kind of... Um, this legal instability was kind of used by the enslavers in New Brunswick, whereas there's kind of an interesting contrast where Nova Scotia, uh, it often sometimes benefited more the enslaved people, uh, this sort of no law, yes law, what do we do kind of scenario. Um, 
And in the archives from my research, I haven't found uh, anything of the sort legislating slavery in New Brunswick, but there is the, um, the 1790 code um, that was imperial code encouraging loyalists to come to New Brunswick. And in there, they say that you can bring your enslaved people to these provinces. So they, they mentioned Quebec, they mentioned New Brunswick, they mentioned Nova Scotia. So in this way, there kind of, there wasn't a law, but there was uh, a government document saying like, hey, you can bring enslaved people here, implying that they would be enslaved there. Um, so it's kind of this like weird gray zone that researchers are still trying to get to, I think. Perfect. Thank no, thank you. Very, very interesting um, and great presentation, like I said. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you, Emily. So Emily, first to you, any last words to summarize or? Um, I'm happy if anyone wants to email me with any questions, I'll put my email oh, wonderful. Uh, in the chat. Very generous and of you. I am excited to continue my research and to finish it and to finish my thesis and to do more mapping and surveys and whatnot. <laughs> And I'm happy that uh, you're all a little bit a part of that journey with me. Thank you, Emily. That was a wonderful presentation. And for all of you who are excited also about what Emily is working on, and I'm sure that's that's most of you, if not all of you, um, we'll keep you posted. We have an Instagram account. Um, we have a Facebook page uh, and we have a YouTube channel. So um, please follow up with us and stay posted on um, what, uh, Emily achieves with her wonderful thesis, uh, Emmy thesis research. And of course, uh, very soon her PhD as well. Mm -hmm. so, so I just wanna have, say the last thank yous. First of all, thank you to the audience for sticking with us. That was, that was a, wow. That was a challenge, right? Getting online. But thank you all for being here and sticking with us at the first Slavery North uh, event. Thanks to Will and Ali, the dedicated technicians behind the scenes who got us online. Thank you to Emily Davidson, the wonderful research assistant at Slavery North. And last but not least, thank you to Emily Drakeo for a wonderful presentation. And thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon and this morning. All the best to you. Please stay in touch. <laughs>